You're listening to Why We Do What We Do. All right, welcome to Why We Do What We Do. I'm going to be your arsonist host, Abraham. And I'm going to be your sonogram host, Shane. Fun. (laughs) And before we get started, a few things. First, happy birthday, Shane. Hey, thanks. Yes, I am uh, uh, aging rapidly, so that's fun. <laughs> Working rapidly to that uh, that inevitable decline in health and all that fun stuff. So happy birthday to me. I'm 36. Yep. So the, at the time of this, <laughs> <laughs> at the time that this comes out, your birthday was yesterday. <laughs> yes. So we're, we're a little ahead of time and in recording time, but the important part is that when people hear this, your birthday was yesterday, and they should send you all the social media well wishes. I subscribe to the notion that time is a flat circle. So, you know, yeah, like I, I'm very Matthew McConaughey about that. You know, it's, it's interesting because like this will come out after my birthday. We're recording this before my birthday and uh, you never really know. Like it's like it's like time is just a weird construct. So, so much happens between <laughs> between now and then. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> for sure. Shane is currently accepting bottles of bourbon uh-huh. and sports cars. If anybody wants to pay my student loans for my birthday, that would be rad, too. Yes, you're allowed to cancel his debt. He'll also be yes. accept, accepting rapid COVID tests. Yes, 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 yes. Well, we have a million. We have a million here in Florida, so they they've gone unused. So I think. Oh, we're that's okay. right. That's right. They're just being stockpiled in Florida without anyone using <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we're good on that. <laughs> and also another quick sort of announcement. I, it's not really an announcement, but always letting people know that we are a psychology podcast. We like to cover all things that humans and non humans do. That it can be described as their psychology mm-hmm. and. That you can subscribe or follow us wherever you are listening to podcasts. We're on all the social media platforms. Our website is www.wwdpodcast.com. We have a Patreon if you would like to listen to this episode ad-free, because we've sold out and we do a bunch of ads now. Mm -hmm. And if you would like to get this episode without ads, there's a way to do that, and that's joining us on Patreon. Uh, You'll also get access to behind-the-scenes content, unedited content, videos, all kinds of fun stuff. So... You can go to patreon.com slash WWD WWD podcast and get access to that if you would like to join for as little as a dollar a month. Yeah. And you get to see what we look like because we hide our faces so much on social media and all that stuff, too. So it's a fact. It's a fact. Yeah. You know, what's great about the videos for our patrons is you get to look at our books behind us and guess what books they are. That's a fun activity you can do. You see both the, the organization and the chaos all in one frame. Ah, yes. It's wonderful. For both of our backgrounds, I'm saying it. Yeah. Lots of books. It's a mess. It's great. I love it. So today we are talking about something that everyone in the United States has been affected by in one way or another, or maybe not everyone, but a lot of people. And it has become a relatively well-known topic. And so we're discussing gender reveal parties, but I'm going <laughs> to modify that just a little bit to call it a genital reveal party. Yes, because we appreciate and respect accuracy and transparency on this on this episode and are on the show in general. That's a value of ours. So we want to make sure that we're very clear about what this is. These are genital reveal parties, and we're just going to have a blast with this. It's going to be a lot of fun. But ooh, blast was that was that an intended pun? That was not, but it works. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, we wrote a bunch of jokes to pepper in through this, and we weren't sure where to fit them exactly. So I thought it'd be fun if we just sort of took turns reading. The jokes that we could have said. Yeah, this is our new segment, Rapid Jokes, or whatever what you want to call it. I don't know. I don't have a good name for it, but this is gonna be this is gonna be fun. So do you want to do the honors, Abraham? Sure. I, I like rapid jokes too. Okay. All right. So we're talking about gender reveal parties. This is the type of gathering among the mainstream middle class where flashing is okay. <laughs> the one time it's okay for everyone to be really interested in a baby's genitals. <laughs> Indeed. Nothing says penis like millions of dollars of damage to natural wilderness. (laughs) Gender reveal parties are now the fourth leading cause of global warming. (laughs) Indeed. The wildfire was accidentally but intentionally spread by people deliberately causing explosions. These are futuristic firemen. Was Fahrenheit 451 about gender reveal parties? (laughs) Deep cut for literature nerds out there. (laughs) That's a great book. That's a great book. Go read it if you haven't. And finally... How about them dicks? <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> We're going to tally up those points, and then we'll just kind of keep track of that as we go forward for the next time we do rapid jokes. Indeed. All right. We are talking a lot about sex and mass destruction. Shane, let's set the scene. We are in Green Valley, Arizona, a town that's a little south of Tucson, go Roadrunners, and it's a beautiful, clear, sunny Sunday on April 23rd, 
2017. We are standing amidst a crowd of eager spectators who are staring at a large black target that's just not too far away. And around the target, we see tall, beige, dry grass everywhere. Everywhere. There are a few small trees dotting the landscape, but mostly dry grass well into the distance. So as I said, there's this target. It's large. It's a black rectangle with a sort of weird checkered diamond in the middle. Above that diamond on the target, in all caps, white letters, is the word BOY. And below the diamond, in all caps, white letters, is the word GIRL. But while the outside of the target sparks eagerness amongst the onlookers, what is inside the target is about to spark panic and disaster. This target is packed with colored tannerite. All right. Now, for those of you who don't know, and I didn't before doing some research on this episode, tannerite is a type of binary explosive used for targets for practicing and shooting. It explodes only when it is struck by something high velocity like a bullet. Like you could hit it with a hammer. It wouldn't explode but you hit it with something moving hot and fast like a bullet and it will explode like dynamite. I also like that it's a binary explosive, which is so perfect for this episode. I didn't even think about that. That's a really good, uh, that's, yeah, good observation. That's, that was the first thing I thought. I was like, oh, of course it is. Of course yeah. it is. It's either it's either one or the other. Now, this Tannerite was designed to explode for just this reason. It was designed to explode based on it, it's going to have this this high impact contact. It's going to explode and it's going to have all this like fun fetty kind of thing coming out of it. <laughs> yep. We're in our scene. We're looking at our target. Dennis Dickey, an off-duty Border Patrol agent, aims a high-powered rifle at the target. Confident of his shot and excited about the possible outcome, he squeezes the trigger. In the video of this, which we'll link below, there's a momentary cloud of blue flying in all directions, but this glorious spectacle lasts less than a second before flames explode across the dry grass in every direction in an instantaneous inferno. Not words you ever want to hear, instantaneous inferno. (laughs) Nope, nope, that sounds very dangerous. This little celebration would turn into a wildfire that spread to envelop a whopping 46,991 acres of land called the Sawmill Fire. It's cost more than $8 million. And to put this in reference, this is more than 73 square miles, which is a little bigger than the entire area of Washington, D.C. And for that, we get the most expensive announcement a penis has ever had. Indeed. We'll chalk that up to another point for that joke thing i mean this is just one of those things where it makes you think why do we do this right so what is this all about and that's what we're going to dive into in this episode yeah we'll talk about what gender reveal parties are how they became popular where they got started how we should or do feel about them and then different ways that people have celebrated those and have celebrated actual gender reveal parties yeah so for now let's take a quick ad break and we'll jump back in in a second Okay, so we were just describing the scene of one of the worst wildfires ever caused by a gender reveal party gone wrong. And so now let's go ahead and dig into a little bit more of the background of these gender reveal parties. Yeah, so a gender reveal party is a party held during pregnancy to reveal the baby's sex to the expectant parents, family, and friends. Prenatal sex discernment technology furnishes the necessary information needed to reveal the gender. We'll put gender in quotes here because we are actually talking about fetal sex. We're talking about biological sex, not talking about the construct of gender, which is an entirely different topic, more sensitive, more important to discuss in in this kind of overarching theme here. Absolutely. And we are going to talk a little bit more about the process of the sex discernment technology. But first, let's talk about where gender reveal parties came from. How old are they? Now, Shane, before we did research for this, did you know how long they had been around? So I don't know how old they are, but I know that we did one for my son, who is nine now. I know that the baby shower that I had for my daughter was all pink. So there was kind of an announcement there, but it wasn't really like a formal gender reveal party like like we know today. Okay, well, I I was actually kind of surprised because like Black Friday and Facebook, it feels like gender reveal parties have been with us for all of time, all of recorded human history as far back as one could remember. Yeah, they've been seamlessly and sort of quietly adopted into mainstream TV shows and movies and regular news cycles, what feels like every month. So it feels like they've been around a long time. Yeah, but like myself, you might be surprised to learn that this practice is not even as old as the first iPhone. So in 2008. 
Jenna Carvanitis and her partner had the idea of asking someone to find out the sex of their child and bake a cake with either pink or blue icing inside to indicate the child's sex. And then, in what was meant to be a whimsical kind of ceremony, they cut into the cake to reveal the pink frosting inside. So this was just kind of this idea that they had, and this blogger's simple idea spread, you might even say like wildfire, Oh man! <laughs> across social media and began to just spawn an absolute movement in the cultural zeitgeist. Excuse me, Abraham. Can you tell me what the word zeitgeist means? Uh. Zeitgeist is essentially just describing a particular period of sort of history or a, a, a section of time is characterized by a certain set of ideas or beliefs or even sort of moods that people had. And so that's what that refers to is sort of the cultural practices of, of a period of time. Yeah. Okay. All right. I like that. That makes sense. That makes sense. So while most of these parties that we're talking about use simple reveals and are fairly low stakes, some people have taken the reveal to serious extremes, including the wildfire that we just talked about, which is probably one of the most extreme examples that we have. Right. In the short time since its inception, gender reveal parties have already started to lose popular support, and really for two primary reasons. First, many people have pointed out the absurdity of placing such tremendous emphasis on what's between a baby's legs. Like That's really all this is about. Yeah. Arguably, this is not even a very interesting feature of a baby. The baby certainly doesn't care. And it's weird to obsess over genitalia in this way. Yeah, but humans tend to do that for all sorts of reasons. True. Now, to put an emphasis on biological sex rather than gender identity, as well as being very harmful to trans youth, mental health type of stuff, this is a serious problem, right? So, so we have found that the, the you know misgendering, we have found that the the, the constructs of gender identity and and all that are very different than than what you're talking about when you talk about the genitals of a baby and also too, what happens in the case where it's not clearly definable what happens in the case where you start looking at different types of birth defects that might occur there's all kinds of things that can happen in this space that that to have a party that says one or the other is just significantly problematic and most listeners will have heard something like this at, um you know at some point probably the kind of people who listen to our podcast and we've talked about it on the podcast before but gender identities are social constructions, and even sex is not so static as male and female genitals or male and female even chromosomes. Like, there are right. a lot of different ways that sex and gender can show up. Intersex individuals, for example, might be born with genital formations that do not clearly fit the definition of either a penis or a vagina. They're often assigned a gender at birth or a sex at birth, and then they sort of will either choose not to really embrace one or the other because they don't really actually fit the definition of either mm -hmm. or they might choose just one and kind of go with it and that, that again it doesn't ultimately really matter how we go about defining those things it just the, the point is that if we try and put people in these little, these boxes we're going to be missing a chunk and a not insignificant chunk of the population for whom that doesn't apply Right. And it can be harmful for those folks to try to put them into a box that does not make sense for them. And we found that time and time again, that misgendering folks and a lack of acceptance for folks that have these types of situations, it becomes significantly problematic for their mental health and whatnot. Yeah. Just imagining that someone like if you just take some cisgender, maybe even somewhat hypermasculine male and, and everyone just starts referring to that person as a pronoun that they do not want to use as maybe she, for example, what that would feel like, right? They'd probably start to get pissed off and also be feel really irritated and disrespected a lot of the time. Yeah. Partially because we placed so much emphasis on the importance of gender identities, but also because like that's not who they want to be known as. And so like yeah. that that would just be messed up to do that. Yeah. I will say just kind of as a caveat to all this. We are not the experts on this particular topic, and that's not yeah. what this episode is about. We will likely do a more in-depth dive on this again. We've covered this on the show before, but we'll probably do another dive into this, maybe with somebody who can identify with the populations that we're talking about here, because we don't want to assume or we don't want to put out information that's not accurate. And we are also recognizing that we're speaking from a cisgender standpoint. Right. So at least I am. I, I don't want to assume yours, uh, Abraham. So <laughs> I will say that. 100% agree with all of that and in a, in a similar, similar position is and, and also understanding that no one person is an archetype for anything that they any group that they might belong to. Everybody is an individual mm -hmm. and should be seen as such. Yeah, nobody's a monolith. 
Uh, right. Yeah. The second reason that people are starting to really dislike the idea of gender reveal parties and the practice of gender reveal parties, the reason that most people are maybe aware of is that these practices have escalated to extremely dangerous events that have now caused just tens of millions of dollars in damage, mostly from fires and also have caused several deaths. <laughs> Could you just I want I want everybody to picture this for a second. Could you imagine going to a party where you're going to learn about the baby's genitals and you die from it? I cannot. <laughs> Spartans would be so disappointed at us. You're not going to Valhalla or anything like that. Now, <laughs> we're going to enumerate some specific examples of how this happened in a moment and kind of what happens. But although many of our listeners may not need the list because they've probably heard about these stories, you've probably seen these disasters and all this stuff. You've probably read all the, you've probably seen examples of this. So we're only kind of talking about this because it's important to understand how destructive these parties have become and how dangerous. And that's why they're falling off into obscurity a little bit. Now, We'll get to the why in a moment, but as to the how this sort of spread the way that it did, it's really all thanks to the very interconnected world we now live in, which is through primarily social media. We had YouTube, Instagram, Pinterest. Really, YouTube was where what existed at a time that was more likely for that to be relevant because I don't think the other two did in 2008. But either way, uh, social media was the primary platform for this. And using the media in this way really significantly increased the likelihood that expecting parents would start taking part in these gender reveal parties. And it makes sense that people would want to do something like this because it is a happy moment for for expectant parents. It is something to celebrate in terms of having a child and all that. And, you know, there everybody's got individual situations where, you know, the party might be more meaningful than others. And so it's understandable that somebody would want to celebrate. Now, add this to an Internet culture. That's going to have a high recept, like a receptive type of approach to the, when I see something, I'm going to like it. I'm going to respond. I'm going to share and all that. And especially when there's individual creativity, right? right so when yeah. you have, I have a cake. Oh, now I've got cupcakes. Now I've got fireworks. Now I've got a wildfire. Yeah. And so you start seeing how like that creativity and that uniqueness changes and shapes up these types of things. I mean, you see it with, it's not just gender reveal parties. It's, it's across the board. There's all kinds of different reasons why something like a particular phenomenon can get remixed, it can get changed, and it can gain popularity just by the creative approach to it. I mean, that was the mannequin challenge. Oh, I was just going to say, before we had TikTok challenges, this is like the the how many different ways can you make colors appear in a in mm -hmm. like a sort of surprising way challenge. Yeah. And we'll talk about some of the strategies that people have used in these gender reveal parties in a moment. But yeah, exactly right. That I think there was this had the exact right blend of like easy to do and you could put your own spin on it. And it's like one of those sort of happy celebration times that everything yeah. came together in a perfect storm to result in a lot of problems. <laughs> yeah. I feel like though this is gonna be one of those things like a couple decades in the future, this will be like how we talk about like shrimp jello. <laughs> <laughs> like those weird, like cook, like those weird recipes that you would see in like jello molds from like the 60s and 70s that were like, right. like that make you sick looking at them. I yeah. feel like that's what's going to happen with this. People are going to be like, oh, we did that. And it's like, yeah, people did that. It's weird. I was not expecting shrimp jello to come up in this. You kind of <laughs> caught me off guard there for a second. <laughs> ah, it's the little things, you know? All right. Another thing is you might be thinking, where are these happening? Or maybe not, but it, it certainly was curious to me of thinking, where are we seeing most of these occurring? One, for the most part, is in the United States. And two, inside mm -hmm. of the United States, it is still a smaller circle where demographic research shows that most of these gender reveal parties are being practiced by expecting parents, of course, who are mostly middle class heterosexual white Americans who are married or partnered. There are some who are non-married, but it's still mostly that group of people. Yeah, it would be very strange if it was non-expecting people. Like, it was just like a couple yeah. that just was like, hey, like, here's a, here's, we're revealing genitals. It's like, whose <laughs> genitals? You'll never know. That's yeah. the mystery. We got this, these at the Adam and Eve store. <laughs> <laughs> so it makes sense, but like, it makes sense they would be expecting parents, but the, but it also, the more you think about it, you're like, okay, this is a very specific population that's doing this. Now, here's what happens at a gender reveal party. The focus of gender reveal parties is 
that of the fetal sex. And such information is a prerequisite. You have to have that information to have the genital reveal party as it goes. Now, this can be determined at or after the gestational age required by the method being used. So for ultrasounds, the most common method that you'll see for kind of observing this type of thing, the earliest this can be reliably done is approximately 65 days. Okay, so 65 days into the pregnancy, an ultrasound can help determine the genitals of the baby, but it is typically done around 20 weeks, so about halfway along. So both the fetal sex and party are typically held during the second trimester of that pregnancy. Right. And post-examination knowledge of the fetal sex by the parents varies. Most commonly a third party, sometimes called a gender guardian. (laughs) Interesting. I wonder if that's a paid (laughs) position. You know? Yeah. Can you? Is it on D, on Indeed? Like, right. can I put that on my LinkedIn profile? <laughs> exactly. I'm like, uh, go to LinkedIn, search for gender guardian. I would like the trans community to co-op that though, like, and to take that into like oh, yeah. making like the really a really great superhero or like a vigilante <laughs> that like beats up people who misgender people. Like, I I would like the idea of that. I'm not that we're promoting <laughs> violence, but I like the idea of a superhero, like an antihero type of thing. Maybe they just you know spread knowledge. They they drop some knowledge on on those those people who. Yeah. Anyway, so this this gender guardian is entrusted with the fetal sex. It remains a secret from the parents until the reveal, the big reveal that usually happens at the party. This person or guardian, whoever it is, is responsible for making the party arrangements to ensure that the reveal happens without prior knowledge being communicated to the parents. Mm -hmm. So what often will happen is the doctor will write the sex down on like a piece of paper and then put it in a sealed envelope to the person orchestrating the reveal. I got to feel like some people are just emailing this anymore, but yeah, or texting it or something, or but texting. maybe they feel like the the paper is even more secure. I'm not sure. I feel like if it were me and I were a doctor in the situation, I would either do it so elaborately and so ridiculously that it would be like, it would be such an effort on my part that it <laughs> just wouldn't it like, and nobody would appreciate it. Like I would write with a feather pen, on like some like old parchment. You'd hide a series of clues like all over you the swamps series, yeah. in Florida. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And then every one of them is like has my like wax seal. Like I, you know, I'm like, I would go over the top with it and then just make it like not fun for people. Now, while the focus remains on the fetal sex, the reveal is typically the climax of the party. So prior to the reveal, the party games are common where attendees or expected parents, guests, or assert the fetal sex. They might do something like a a form of competition between Team Pink and Team Blue, you know, where the parents or participants may kind of select which side they're on and they kind of do all the stuff. And there's a lot of different activities that happen within that. And people get creative, so there's some unique ones too. I do also feel like the colors... Always being pink and blue are a little absurd, but Mm -hmm. I want to go to a gender reveal party where it's like green or yellow and they just don't (laughs) say anything. They're like, ta-da! What's inside me? (laughs) Purple? What if it was like just black? Like it's like a black smoke out of like a, like, you know, like when people like rev up their engines and like the exhaust comes out of the, the, you know, it's like, there's the color. Like I want to see just like black. It's like, it's evil. Like I want something like that, you know? Now, Many people who are around our age or the around the age of people who are having gender reveal parties, you've probably started to notice that as people go through these life transitions, they're looking for every conceivable reason for them to throw a party for you to give them gifts. Mm-hmm. You've got your like wedding shower, your bridal shower, your engagement shower, your actual wedding, your reception. There's probably gonna be three or four more peppered in there sometimes. And then around your your you got baby showers and now gender reveal parties and Etc. They're just gonna like nine or ten or twelve times a year try and find ways to throw parties so that you'll buy them gifts. So gifts are often sometimes part of a gender reveal party. And in which case, certain there is usually an area of the party that is designated for gifts. I don't know exactly what maybe there's like a choose your own genital appropriate gift type. <laughs> Pin the genital theme. on the baby. Yeah, that's right. Pin the genital on the baby. Maybe that's what the gift is. <laughs> Stuff like that. So that's also a feature of these parties. Yeah. Now, the fun part of these is the actual reveal. So, like, you go to the party, not for the snacks and the hors d'oeuvres and the games and all that. You go for the reveal. And most reveal methods utilize gender-associated colors that are culturally relevant. And you'll see pink and blue is usually the what you'll see in representing male and female, you know, like blue being male pink being female, that's usually what happens in the United States. Whatever the reveal is, is going to be some kind of elaborate thing, right? So the most common methods you're going to see are like cutting into special cakes, launching or popping balloons. By the way, 
don't launch balloons and also don't launch those paper lanterns either because you're mm-hmm. just sending fire into the sky. Also very dangerous. Yeah. So maybe don't do that. Confetti, streamers, pinatas, colored smoke, silly string. Other seasonally related items could be Easter eggs, jack-o'-lanterns, Christmas presents, 4th of July or New Year's fireworks can also be incorporated. So there's a lot of different things that can be like different ways that people reveal this type of thing. And it is interesting what people will do. It's interesting how creative people can get. What'd you do for your son's gender reveal party? It was a box with a balloon in it. So okay. like when the box opened, it was like a present. And when the box opened, a balloon that was taped to the bottom of the box so it didn't float away oh, popped okay. up out of it. Oh, yeah, okay, so got it. It was, like, it was like several balloons that came out of it. I see. Okay. So you did a balloon reveal. A balloon reveal. Yeah. A blue balloon reveal. Didn't use the alligators that were already nearby. We had a, a, an alligator trainer ride up on two alligators and be like, it's a boy. And then run off on his airboat. <laughs> so did you have a gender reveal guardian or a gender guardian or something? Yeah, but I don't remember who it was. Okay. Because I was like, do we have to do this? Like, I kind of <laughs> had that feeling. It was cool to find out, but it was like also like one of those things where it was actually now that I think about it. I think that we might have been the gender guardians because I think that we knew and we revealed it to everybody else. Oh, I see. I'm so foggy on the details because I just don't sleep ever. So <laughs> I, I'm pretty sure that's what we did. I think that we knew about it because I, I'm pretty sure that we stuffed the box full of balloons. OK, so I, I suppose I didn't even think about the fact that there would be that arrangement where it's not actually for the parents. It's for the friends and family who are gathering there. Yeah. And so, yeah, that actually makes a lot of sense. I can see that occurring. But I think that makes it weirder. It's like we already know what what's between our baby's legs. Now you need to know. That's right. Like, now that I think of the more I think about it, I'm like, that's weird, too. Like, it's all weird. That's actually a good point. I, I agree. <laughs> So, yeah, essentially the, the idea here being, if ever, if you haven't picked up on this yet, it is the some way of having a color appear and that that color then is the indicator. So, you don't it doesn't necessarily say boy or girl, although it might. But most of the time, it's just going to be either pink or blue or maybe red or blue. Yeah. And although the things that we mentioned were the common ways, there are some certainly way, some other ways that people have gone about doing this. And, and what we're going to do is we're going to take. A quick ad break, and when we come back, we're going to talk about Jenna Carvinitis, the creator of the Gender Reveal Parties, and we'll talk about some of the other ways people have found to very creatively make colors appear. <laughs> I like that. Okay, so we were just talking about some of the common ways that people have practiced doing Gender Reveal Parties or have practiced, I guess, having colors show up. And I teased before the break that we're going to talk about uh, Jenna Carvinitis, the creator of Gender Reveals. Now, there is sort of a twist to her story here, which is that her daughter ended up discovering that she that they were a gender non-conforming individual in 2019. They dress in masculine clothes. They do identify as female, but otherwise identify sort of as not binary, at least not gender conforming. So Jenna has said that she views gender differently now after kind of all this has come out and all the experience and exposure and does not support the parties that as they are not sensitive to the LBGTQ community and intersex communities feelings like they are not sensitive to those groups. As a matter of fact, they can be pretty problematic. So Jenna has come out as the inventor of the gender reveal party being like, hey, don't do this. This is kind of bogus. She said the post went viral and her views on sex and gender have changed, especially when she's talking to her daughter. So, quote, she's, her daughter, telling me, Mom, there are many genders. Mom, there's many different sexualities and all different types, and I take her lead on that. And I know it's been harmful to some individuals. It's 2019. We don't need to get our joy by giving others pain, she said. I think there are new ways to have these parties, end quote. So, some not yeah. of quote in there, but <laughs> but that's what she said. <laughs> And that idea is as simple as just eating cake. So celebrate the baby, she says. There's no way to have a cake to cut into to see if you're going to like chess. So let's just have a cake, end quote. And that's kind of what she, like, that's her kind of new thing. Let's celebrate the baby. Yeah. You know, when they would have done Shane's gender reveal party, it would have come out with a a bunch of punk music instead. <laughs> yeah. It would have just been like Blitzkrieg Bop. <laughs> We call it like Blitzkrieg Baby or like, uh, I don't know, like I'm wearing a Ramones shirt. Baby. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the Ramones have a song called Baby I Love You. And so they maybe that's maybe that's the song that you play. I don't know. There you go. 
Now, since the fires that have occurred, not only has she been sort of tentatively moving away from these and saying that she has mixed feelings, but after one of the really big fires in California, she posted a message on her Facebook that reads, quote, stop having these stupid parties for the love of God. Stop burning things down to tell everyone about your kid's penis, end quote. At the core of what this is, that's exactly what it is. So I'm glad that she's kind of very outspoken about this thing now. Nothing says penis like a millions of dollars of damage to natural wilderness. (laughs) Exactly. It's just totally bonkers. So I guess the question comes down to you and and, and part of the the whole reason that we even started the podcast to begin with is we have to ask the question, why do we do this? Why do we do what we do? Yeah, we talked about the how. And so now we'll try and dig in on the why. And I think for one, ascertaining the gender or the sex, the genital information about a fetus has actually been something people have been interested in a very long time. And a lot of Western culture and many other cultures around the world, males have had special positions of privilege and dominance in cultures, positions of power. They were often the ones who received dowries for marriage, for example. And so people were devising strategies to try and determine and influence the sex of babies. And we're not going to get into Mm -hmm. what all those entail, but they'd be doing things like trying to taste urine and figure out, okay, it's a boy. Great. Everything is good. We can really celebrate and be happy. Or, oh, it's a girl, damn, we better start gathering our dowry so we can pawn this piece of crap off onto some other family who's lucky enough to have a boy. Yeah. And so that's something that has been around for a long time. And I think that the reason it was of interest before was for those reasons I just I just stated that there was a lot of monetary reasons and privilege that went along with having one sex over another. Well, and another one too is you know, you're you're talking about specific lineage. When you talk about royalty, you've got oh, yeah. issues where women in royal families could not be the king, so they could not be the leaders. They were usually married off, and so the men, like having a male bloodline and having that next king in line, was always really important. You'll see that where talking about the you know positions of power and privilege you had in some cultures where men or like boys were immediately taken from the womb and raised and trained to be warriors in specifically warrior cultures where that was so such a primary kind of feature or characteristic of that culture. So you have this situation where the more male babies that we have, the stronger our warrior base can be and the stronger our military can be and so on and so forth. So you've got this piece where it's like, like positions of power relied heavily on lineage and males being born in those spaces, even though we know that that is like totally ridiculous. And the lineage piece is important too, is the fact that in a lot of Western cultures, at least the family name, the last name, is passed down on the through male descendants because when they marry, then the female in a lot of these cultures, ours included, takes on the male's last name. And so then their family name is basically gone. And so a family name will only pass on as long as it continues to have male descendants. And so there's this whole legacy with family trees that comes from that that also was really was important. So again, there's basically just a lot of important variables tied up in the idea of particular genders because of these cultural practices and not Mm -hmm. for any actual pragmatic or practical reason, but because of these cultural practices that placed a greater emphasis on having a penis than having a vagina. Well, and I think it's important too to understand, like you bring up cultural practices and how that gets passed down from generation to generation, right? So like Mm -hmm. gender reveal parties are not being passed down from generation to generation in the context that we're talking about, but the obsession with genitals and the understanding and finding of genitals and all that, and, and also binary gender norms in certain cultures are passed down. I mean, like I can't remember growing up thinking that there was anything like somebody who was trans, that there were more than two genders. Like I was not raised to know that that was something that came in my adult life. And my kids are going to grow up in a world where they're exposed to that information and they understand that. But I mean, my parents weren't exposed to that. Their parents weren't exposed to that. So you're talking about this kind of situation where educational norms and kind of the way it's always been gets passed down from generation to generation as, as we understand it. And so we're seeing kind of that break the mold now, which is nice. Yeah, and to your point, just as Jenna was saying in her quote that in 2008, when this got started, that was still something that wasn't even all that widely known. And to me, 2008 doesn't feel like it was all that long ago, Yeah, right? Yeah. Like, we're talking about that. That was 14 years ago now, which, I mean, is not a little amount of time, but that's still, like, that's so recent in terms of this specific cultural practice, I guess. There's also, too, you know, you've got 
like it's a fairly new thing. People always find a reason to celebrate. People always like to celebrate pregnancies and births. I mean, baby showers and sprinkles have have been a thing for generations. So like yeah. this is just a kind of a new spin on that too. You know, it's kind of a different way to go about that. Yeah, and a lot of times, even you know, as this, the technology for determining fetal sex has bec- has come along, or if people chose to wait until the the baby was actually born to find out, they would still often have these big sort of celebrations to say, "Hey, it's a boy," or "Hey, it's a girl," and that was kind of a big deal. Mm-hmm. So it really was not that big a leap to take that idea and turn it into this idea of a gender reveal party specifically. And just have it be its own unique ceremony. So I think in terms of thinking about this really clearly, there is a history of cultural sort of selection that has led to this practice sort of morphing into what it was. That makes a lot of sense if you if you sort of trace the timeline. And in addition to that, I think that you're in a situation where people want to celebrate. They want to celebrate something. They have an opportunity for sort of a big to do. There's some sort of pomp and ceremony. They get gifts. And they make it game-like. They get to have their own little creativity. So there's kind of a lot of payoff here that's happening for new parents. They are excited about their their new baby that's coming into their lives. They're excited to start planning for how they're going to gender that child for years to come Mm -hmm. and the kinds of colors that they're going to dress it in and ways they're going to decorate its room and all that sort of thing. And so all of those, it does make sense that the people are going to want to sort of throw a party about it and turn it into a thing. So I think with that being said, I mean, there's a lot of reasons why somebody might do this or why expecting parents might do it, but there's not really a lot of research on it that explains kind of the actual motivations for this or kind of like why people continue to do this. Yeah, and I, I guess we should say that we're we're speaking a little bit off the cuff in terms of really digging in on the why, because as you said, there hasn't been any real empirical research. But I think suffice it to say that we understand where some of the motivation and payoff comes from. For people who are, they they find this to be a rewarding experience. And also, to be fair, for most people, these do not end in tragedy and disaster. A lot of people <laughs> have picked up this practice and it goes just fine. Yeah. You know, I would make the argument that the majority of them do go okay. Right. Because most of the time they involve cake. <laughs> exactly. And who doesn't love cake? That's what I'm saying. There's somebody out there who doesn't love cake, and there's probably a whole episode that we could do on that, which I don't understand. That's that's a whole demographic of people that I don't understand. Yeah. So while I think I don't want it to sound like I'm super in favor of this idea, as we sort of mentioned, I think there is harm both in terms of the fact that we are getting hyper-focused on genitals and sex, and I don't think that that's particularly healthy. I think that it misconstrues the importance of gender and gender identity and the kind of individuality that one should be able to experience as a human, Mm -hmm. but also the fact that these have become very dangerous and they've gotten just way out of hand. I don't even necessarily, I mean, I do think that they need to be, if they were going to continue, they need to scale back, but I also think they don't need to continue. So that would be sort of my position on it, I suppose. Exactly. I agree with that. I agree with that. So I think... There's not much more to unpack as far as that, but I think I do think it's important to talk about the kind of like the different events that have occurred that have helped kind of diminish the popularity of this particular type of party. So for those listeners who are listening who are not from the United States, you might not even know any of this stuff. You might not have even heard of a genital or gender reveal party or any of that stuff. I keep I keep mixing those up because we've been saying yeah. as we've been prepping the episode, we've been saying genital reveal party so much that I can't even think of it any other way now. I think that's right. This is another absurdity in the United States. Uh, it seems to be unique to the United States and let's hope for everyone's sake that it is. But we definitely want to talk about some of the gender reveal parties that have gone wrong because you might know about them, but it's important to understand like not only is this a problem, but this has also caused mass destruction. That's a great setup. Let's actually take one more quick break, and then we'll talk about some of the ways that these have gone poorly right after this. Okay, so we were just talking about the fact that this is relatively U.S.-centric. For those of you who follow U.S. news who don't live in the United States, why? But just in (laughs) case you didn't, or even if you're in the United States, who who knows if, if you've heard about these, but let's just go through them. In October 2019, an Iowa woman was killed by debris from an explosion of a homemade device meant to reveal her grandchild's gender. Essentially, I was reading on the news, they basically created a pipe bomb and the shrapnel hit her in the head that flew as far as another 174 feet away or something of that nature. It was, wow. a, it was a pretty, yeah, it was a pretty gnarly explosion. 
So that is one of the tragedies that has occurred as a outcome of a gender reveal party. That is just wild. The thing that she was like building a pipe bomb and it was like, we're going to show off this kid's nuts. So <laughs> in September 2020, a gender reveal pyrotechnic device started the El Dorado fire near Yucapa, California, and destroy- it destroyed homes. It prompted evacuations. It burned thousands of acres, and it caused the death of one firefighter. So it was pretty destructive. Welcome to the world, kid. Yep. <laughs> On February 21st, 2021, there was an accidental explosion of an in-development gender reveal device in Liberty, New York. So essentially, they were testing a prototype before the actual one. Again, they functionally built a pipe bomb. That's basically what it was. Yeah. So this occurred in Liberty, New York. It was actually the father-to-be who was building it. He was apparently a mechanic and relatively good one at that. He was in his 30s, uh, so relatively young guy. And it, the pipe bomb killed him and injured his younger brother. That's just awful. Like, yeah. I would hate for that to be my story. It's just so bad. Yeah. Now, another in early 2021, an airplane streaming pink smoke to reveal the genitals of a baby crashed into the ocean as onlookers, including the parents to be, watched all of this happen. Now, two people in the plane died as a result of that crash. So, and this is like kind of the, this is the, the one upsmanship too, that's worth talking about. Like, you know, it's like, Oh, I saw some fireworks. Let's make a bomb. I saw this bomb. Let's get a plane. Like, it's like, you know, everybody's trying to one up themselves for that most creative thing. And it's, it's getting more and more dangerous. Speaking of which <laughs> yeah. in April of 2021, a family decided to use 80 pounds of colored Tannerite. That stuff that was used in the fire. We described at the top of the episode, they basically set this up in a quarry in New in New Hampshire. Now, fortunately, no one was injured in this one, but the explosion was so intense that it actually shook a bunch of nearby houses, and the occupants of of those houses thought that this was an earthquake. They said pictures were like falling off the walls. I mean, they basically it was like they were mining, like with explosives. That that yeah. was the level of explosion that they caused. It's just wild. So, with that being said, we talked about the idea that there are gender reveal parties that are not so bad. And they are a little bit different than what we've talked about. So we're actually going to talk about some true gender reveal parties that are happening instead that are far more wholesome, far more supportive, and and much more in line with what a gender reveal party should be. Yeah. So before we were talking about genital reveal parties and this gender reveal party, some families of transgender individuals will host these reveal parties for transgender family members to sort of come out and to celebrate their, I guess, acknowledgement of their gender identity and what they want that to be. And there's a cool example of this I found in the news that there was a family in Ohio who held this gender reveal party for their trans son who popped out of a box full of multicolored balloons <laughs> waving a pride flag, which I think I is really that. fun. Yeah, I think that's, that's so really wholesome. cute. I mean, I wouldn't have done the balloons personally, but I just yeah. love the idea of being at a party where anybody hops out of a cake. Like, I think that's fantastic. Sure. Or a box or anything like that. So I think that that part of it is already I'm sold no matter. It could be a pizza party. It could be a party about sharks. I don't even care. Like if somebody's hopping out of a box or a cake, I'm stoked. That being said, though, I think this is like one of the most wholesome and like gender affirming practices that you can have. Like you have a celebration of somebody coming out like that's such a that's such a wonderful spin on this particular type of of party that we're talking about. I completely agree. And also, just as a quick side note, I don't know if people have seen the different flags for the LGBT community, but just the pride flag itself is really beautiful. It's a I mean, it's simple, but it's beautiful. I think it's really cool. Yeah, absolutely. Now, another point here is that conscientious mothers who espoused more egalitarian gender role beliefs were less likely to know fetal sex. So this is important to recognize, too, is like as as mothers who are entering parenthood and all that, they're going to have different approaches to this. And some folks are less likely to know. And that's okay too. Yeah, absolutely. And then, you know, we were talking about all those disasters just as a quick reminder about the Arizona fire. We already talked about it, but that was one. I think it had the largest amount of acreage and damage. And that's why I put it at the top of the episode, but that did belong in the list of things we've gone wrong. There were actually plenty of others. I found um, some of them were fairly mild. There was a dad who was shot in the groin by like an air cannon that was doing a gender reveal thing. (laughs) He was fine, but I mean, obviously not great in the moment. (laughs) Some people who they got an alligator to bite into a watermelon filled with pink or blue jelly. I don't remember which, or this is what is supposed to happen. I'm not sure. I think the alligator ended up threatening the guests (laughs) as one would. As one, yeah, they are predators, not afraid of humans, as it turns out, because they're huge and yes, very good at, at being predators. 
Yeah, they're scary. But they were supposed to bite into this watermelon that was filled with this jelly that was like a thing that was going to happen. So again, people come up with all these wild ways to do these sorts of things. Anyway, I think I think that's mostly what I have to say about gender reveal parties. Do you have anything else before we get to some take home points? I think it's important to recognize that the majority of this episode we've talked about genital reveal parties and not actual gender reveal parties. Absolutely correct. And to that point, as we said, gender is a social construct. It is definitely not determined by biological characteristics with an individual's gender identity impossible to determine medically because that's something that they're going to experience because it's something that we create as a context and a culture. Different cultures have different ways of practicing gendering. Masculinity in the United States does not look the same as it does in other countries. Thus, when a reveal of a fetus's genitals is made, it is the sex. And even that, again, is not all that interesting. It's just like what's between the baby's legs. Yeah. It's not the gender that's being revealed. It's just whatever gear it's got down there. Gender reveal parties rely heavily on male-female gender binary roles, which assumes that a child will not be intersex or trans or non-conforming or anything like that. But when it comes to intersex specifically, that occurs in one out of 4,500 to 5,500 births. So intersex is more common than people realize and recognize, and, and these gender reveal parties don't account for that at all. And essentially, the argument has been made that practicing these gender reveal parties, that's just reinforcing gender essentialism precluding and minimizing transgender identification. And all of this leads like we already have the this is one of the groups in the at least the United States, as well as other places around the world with some of the highest rates of suicide. There are mental health and, and emotional issues that occur. And part of it is this being stamped as one thing early in life and being sort of pushed into a box in which you do not feel that you belong. Yeah, that's going to be really difficult for a lot of people. And I, as you said, I I've been privileged enough to never have felt that way in my life that I don't know what that's like for someone to have to go through that. And and I don't want anyone else to have to suffer in, in either. So, yeah, you know, many parents have rejected gender reveal events because of the greater awareness of gender identity. And I think also maybe a concern for not blowing up themselves or their family members. Yeah. And I think that's important. So like I think uh, Jenna said earlier, like we shouldn't get our joy from other people being in pain. Yeah. And so I think that's a really important thing. So I think to kind of my, my last take home point for all this would be congratulations. It's a baby human. And that's more than enough to be happy about because that is such a joy. Yeah, it can be. A joy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you never, you'll never sleep again, but <laughs> I'll never yeah. sleep again. I've developed a coffee habit. <laughs> But yeah, like that, let's be excited about that. And we don't need to be so concerned about what's dangling down there or not dangling, I guess. Yeah. Or any, any mixture of that. Yeah, exactly right. Yeah. It could, could be anything and whatever they, whatever they will be, they will be and good on them for it. Absolutely. All right. Let's get to some recommendations. Recommendations. All right, I am recommending The Umbrella Academy Season 1 because I haven't seen Season 2 yet. It's been out. I just am a little behind the ball on on getting through this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So anyway, I just finished Season 1. This is a Netflix TV show. It is about essentially a group of super-powered kids, and I loved this show so far. I was really impressed. Have you seen it? I've seen a few episodes of it. I haven't finished season one, but it is like real. It's done really, really well. Super well. I wasn't sure coming into it what to think or feel about it or what to expect. And I ended up actually being really impressed with the first season. I thought that the plot moves really well. The stakes feel real. They did really good just writing and dialogue and character development. And the whole show, I think, really worked for me. So that's my recommendation. I love that. I love that. I'm glad that our recommendations recommendations are in line today, too, because I also have a comic book feature that I, I am so glad to talk about. Woot. My recommendation is the Christopher Nolan Batman trilogy, which includes Batman Begins, Dark Knight, and Dark Knight Rises. Yeah. So, like, these three movies are a perfect trilogy, with a peak, obviously, being Dark Knight and Heath Ledger's Joker and all that. Yeah. One thing that's beautiful about these movies is it's not over the top. It's not ridiculous. It's not, like, super natural in any way. It's a very grounded Batman story, but it's Christopher Nolan, and everything that he shoots is just beautiful. I mean, these movies are... Even if you don't like Batman, these are beautiful, 
beautifully shot movies. I just I just finished Dark Knight Rises last night, and it just looks incredible. Yeah. Even if you can get past Tom Hardy's Bane voice, which is odd. Yeah. But also the the whole reason his voice sounded that way, not through like the, not the mechanical part, but the accent was because it, the idea of Bane is like you don't really know where he's from or where he originates. Mm. So like he's like a and he, so that's kind of why he he talks like that. If you ever get a chance, there's a parody video that they overdub Bane. He, like he talks about like being a health nut in it. He's like strawberries are packed with fiber. <laughs> like and he got he calls somebody like a, he's like he's like you are what you. And he like makes fun of like his his men's lunch orders. Nice. He's like Gary, pizza, strawberry or is like a, a starchy crust, uh, sugary tomato paste. Gary, we expect more of our men. <laughs> Um, it's like a really funny, goofy thing. So anyway, go watch this trilogy. It is fantastic. It's cast brilliantly. Christian Bale is peak performance in these movies. Yeah. It's really a great, great watch. Yeah, I do love that trilogy as well. You know, one thing I meant to say, I forgot, is uh, did you know that the creator of uh, the Umbrella Academy was Gerard Way, the singer of My Chemical Romance? Yeah. Yes, I did. Or he did the comic books, at least. Yeah, he did the comic books. Yeah. Yeah, very cool. It's good stuff. All right. Well, I think that's all we have to say on gender reveal parties, unless you have anything else. Nope, I got nothing else. All right. If you'd like to tell us about your gender reveal parties or your decision to not do a genital reveal party or tell us about a TV show or movie trilogy that you're really into, you should reach out to us at info at www.wwdpodcast.com. You can also reach us on all of the social media platforms. And before we go, we need to say a special thank you to the people who help make this podcast continue to happen. Those are our amazing Patreon supporters, which includes the likes of Amanda, Kathleen, Joshua, Justin, Justine, Kim, Kostia, Layla, Megan, Mike M, Mike T, and Shauna. Also, shout out to the team, Justin Greenhouse, for his amazing editing on these. Amber, Shane, Selena, Kyle, Allen, and thank you so much, Britt Bowerly, for putting together the notes on this particular episode. Mm-hmm. So yeah, this is a fun one. Yeah, it absolutely was. I hope that you enjoyed this. I look forward to hearing from everyone. This is Abraham. And this is Shane. We're out. See ya. You've been listening to why we do what we do. You can learn more about this and other episodes by going to www.wwdpodcast.com. Thanks for listening. And we hope you have an awesome day.